Good morning. I'm your leader this morning. So if you'll respond after my line. Come, people of God, gather as faithful disciples of Christ. We see the one who frees us from uncertainty and doubt. Come, join the welcome of God's people, people who meet together for justice and peace. We see the one who is trustworthy, the one who gives us what is good. Come, join the celebration of God's people, people of the one who was and is and shall ever be. We raise our voices in praise and honor to God and worship the one who is faithful. Uh, opening hymn, number 127, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. <clears throat> Good singing, everyone. It's great to see you all here as we gather for worship. And welcome to all who are watching us online. It's great to have you participating as well. As uh, we continue in our time of worship, just recognize there's opportunities to engage with one another online. Uh, feel free to comment, say hello, and connect. Uh, if you're here and this is your first time with us, we invite you to fill out the white welcome card that should be in the pew in front of you. And again, if there's any way that we can be in ministry with you as a church, uh, please make a note of that on the card. And those can be pla placed in the offering plate uh, as they come by or as you go to the back uh, to put that in there. A couple of things going on in the life of the church uh, this week. We begin Lent. Uh, that begins with Ash Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, and we'll be gathering here uh, in North Haverhill at 6.30, uh, and we'll have some time of song and reflection, and then there will be stations that will be placed throughout the sanctuary as a way of engaging and preparing our hearts for this Lenten season as we prepare for Easter. Also note there is an opportunity in the earlier part of the day at 11.30, there will be a traditional Ash Wednesday service at Woodsville, and then that's going to be followed by lunch. Come to be a part of either of those experiences, I'd be glad to have you be there. Um, also, uh, that uh, we, as we go into Lent, one of our traditions in North Haverhill and Woodsville is to be a part of uh, this connection of churches as we do Lenten suppers together. And so that first Lenten supper is going to be this coming next Sunday uh, at Monroe Methodist Church, and it goes from 5 to 6. And uh, it's a way of connecting with other believers and reflecting again on this meaning of Easter for us in our lives. And so I invite you to come and be a part of any and all of those. Um, also have one other announcement. Uh, we as a church are uh, supporting and being a part of ministry to Kentucky. And so David's going to come and, and make an appeal for us as we get prepared for what that looks for us for next month. And so uh, 
I invite you to welcome Pastor David Adams. Come on up. <laughs> He's a hell of a coach, isn't he? He's wonderful. He's wonderful. You can't just sit there and, and listen and not do something like jump up and help. Um, our team is 10 in numbers, um, and we're strong and bold, and we're ready to go. Um, but we have a glitch, and I'm coming to an appeal for you to you for if you can help, you can help. If you can't, you can't. We'll go with what we got. But for three years, we've not gone, and in that, we've accumulated tubs of stuff, and we've got a ladder, a 12-foot ladder to go, and we've got a saws to go, and shovels to go, and stuff like that. Well, we can't get them all in our SUVs. So we've had a truck with a trailer planned with a person to go and drive it, and that fell through. So we've got stuff that we really do need to get down to Kentucky. So if you have a trailer or you have a vehicle that we can put this stuff into, it needs to be about 13 feet long, that's the ladder. Um, the saw is a, is a radial arm saw, nice bench saw, and the other is a portable saw. So then we've got tubs of stuff. Um, so help if you can, let me know, or let David know. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Yep. And uh, we're glad to be a part of this ministry to Kentucky and a uh, support of that. So, yeah, if you have a way of uh, putting together a trailer or just want to take a, a drive down to Kentucky, uh, <laughs> make sure to get in touch with me or get in touch with Dave. Uh, we'll help make that happen. So as we share the passing of the peace of Christ to one another, I'm going to invite you to stand and uh, share this question, which is, what is something that you do well? Uh, and so I invite you to share on that question, either online or in person, as we uh, get ga gathering for our worship together. Well, good morning, everybody. I invite you to find your seat. They do a lot of talking. Huh? <laughs> Just a reminder that there's refreshments and fellowship time after church as well. And so uh, just note that that's a possibility. If you want to carry on that conversation later, you may do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> what we're saying is you've got a warm fellowship together. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, well, Kipton is our uh, kids' representative today. A little fist bump there. So I asked everybody to answer the question, what is one thing that they do well? Do you want to share with us one thing you do well? I race. You race on your feet, on your bike? I have RC cars. That I RC? Oh, remote control cars. That's amazing. That's very, very cool. Have you done that for a very long time or a short period of time? Like four years. Four probably. years. Okay, awesome. Hey, this is a good skill to have. And uh, all ready to become uh, driving your own car later in the future, right? All right, so everyone know Kipton's going to be on the road. Be aware. It's happening. <laughs> it's happening. It's very good. Well, I asked that question because Jesus is saying that we're supposed to use our gifts, our talents, and abilities for good things in the world. Do you think that's a possibility that we could do that? Yeah, I don't know. Well, maybe. I bet there might be some interesting things you could do with remote control that could benefit others, particularly driving drones. I can imagine you driving flowers to deliver them to people 
with your remote control. What do you think? That would be funny. That would be funny, yeah. <laughs> and everyone else is out there like, I'm not sure if you want flying a drone around my house. <laughs> that kind of thing. But so all, as we think about our lives and all the good things that God has put in our lives, he invites us to use them, not just for ourselves, but to provide those for others. Do you think that's something we can do? Cool. Yeah. So let's put our hands together and say, Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your love. And for the abilities we have. And for the abilities that we have. Help us to use them for you. Help us to use them for you. Amen. Amen. All right. And Kipton's going to go with our teachers for Sunday school. All right. I invite Joyce to come up for a uh, reading. This morning's gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 5, 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Stand for the Thank you, Joyce. Joyce was willing to stand up and be willing to be our reader today, and so uh, it's always great when we have persons willing to do that. And uh, note that as a church, we don't exist uh, as a professional organization, uh, but as a group of volunteers. And so it really does require all of us to say, how can I participate? Uh, because this is not a, a one-person show or a professional show. It is what we do together, and uh, always wonderful when people step up and say, I can do that. So as, as a church, we've been focusing on scriptures through uh, Jesus' ministry that help us understand something of Jesus' practice for his life and what he encouraged the disciples to do in their lives. We're talking about that Jesus' lifestyle as a way of helping us understand how it is we might practice what it is that Jesus did in his life as well. And uh, this is the last uh, Sunday before we get into Lent, and so uh, there's so much that is in the Gospel, so much that's in the Sermon on the Mount and, and the various things that Jesus taught and did with his disciples. Uh, it was very hard to pack all that in in seven weeks uh, before we get to Lent. Uh, but today I wanted to make sure that we didn't miss what I consider to be one of the core pieces of what Jesus was all about. Because Jesus himself understood himself who, as somebody who was sent sent by God, sent into the world so that we might know the love of God, so that we might know God's love and embrace for us. Jesus and God did not simply stay in heaven and put some sort of uh, post-it note on the moon and say, come and get it, or discover God's love, but instead came into the world in the very flesh to be with us so we could experience and know God's love in a very personal and real way. And so that's a core identity, as I think about who Jesus is, as I think of Jesus as one who was sent. And we think about that whole idea of the Trinity, of God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and says, you know, I was sent by God and I'm going to send to you the Holy Spirit. And what's interesting is that understanding is that the Trinity itself, God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, are always in a continual motion of being sent. There, there's an ancient Greek word that was used to describe that, and it was perichoresis. And I don't expect you to remember that word, but it's essentially an understanding of a dance. 
some sort of dance between the Holy Trinity that is continually sending one another. And you can imagine this sort of lovely dance between God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that is continually moving and participating and connecting with other people. There's this wonderful ascentness of who God is, even in God's self. And that is exactly who God has called us to be. Jesus continued to send the disciples. Yeah, he sent them initially at 12. 12 disciples were sent out, and then 32 were sent, or 72 were sent out. And then further on, the rest of the disciples were sent when he says, go and make disciples of all nations. A core piece of who we are as God's people is a people who are sent. And the same way that Jesus was sent, we are sent. And I just want to pause for a moment to recognize that over the history of the church, that has last 2,000 years, somehow uh, the idea of being in mission has stopped becoming our core identity of who we think we are. Instead, somehow we think of a mission, like what David was describing, uh, we're sending a group of people to Kentucky, and that's our mission as the church. Or maybe we think of maybe our food pantry on the corner that we, we've supported, and that's, that is our mission to the community that really misses that fact that we as a whole, as a body of Christ, are people who are on mission together. That's who we are. And we have the privilege together to participate in a variety of ways. But it's the core piece of who we are, not just as a, a small a extra ministry on the side, but as a core piece of God's people who are sent. And in that way, we don't have the privilege to simply sit on the sidelines. To watch, you know, I don't know, last Sunday many people watched the Super Bowl and, you know, I am not a great football player. I barely know the rules, right? But I get to watch that game. But in the game of life, the church is not a bystander in what God is doing. We are central players in God's mission, in the mission field of life. And God calls us into action. And nobody has the privilege of simply stepping back and go, not me, because <laughs> we're all a part of this together. That's who we are as God's people. Now, the scripture we heard this morning, Jesus says, you are salt and you are light. And I want to explore a little bit more about the salt and light and how it is that that helps us to understand more of what Jesus meant when he talks about us being part of God's mission to the world. And we recognize that salt has several major pieces of what salt does. And uh, one of the first things I, I love to think about with salt is that uh, salt enhances whatever it touches, uh, particularly food. Uh, if you've uh, ever been on a diet where you weren't allowed to have sodium, you recognize what a benefit it is to have salt <laughs> on your food. In fact, I was watching a, a documentary recently. They were talking about it. it's a YouTube cooking thing. And they're saying it doesn't matter how many spices you add to that particular dish. Until you actually add salt, you don't actually enhance the flavor at all. You can't taste the meat. You can't taste whatever it is. You have to add some salt to it. Uh, recently, my wife and I were cooking, and we forgot the salt in our bran muffins. Oh, boy. <laughs> it was a chore to get those down, is what we're saying. Salt enhances whatever it touches. And, and Jesus calls us the salt of the earth. And if we are thinking about salt as something that enhances, Jesus calls us out in the world that we might bring out the fullness of life that is around us. Where is their joy? Where is their peace? What is it that we can enhance in the world around us to bring life to it so that we might rejoice together? We also recognize that salt preserves. You know, we think about some of the great uh, things that salt preserves, particularly meat, uh, that it keeps life, keeps it longer, helps it to, to resist uh, bacteria, helps it to resist uh, those things that would cause it to age. And it does so in a way that sanctifies it. That is, that makes it, you know, gets rid of that bacteria. It, it pushes out and kills those things that would cause it to rot and decay. That salt becomes a purifying agent as it gets sent out. It purifies the things that it touches. Jesus calls us as the salt of the world that we aren't just for ourselves, but we're called out to transform the world around us, to be a part of the enhancing and the, the bringing to life and joy of the things around us, but also that there is a way of calling to attention those things that are rotting, those things that are decaying, those things that are not of God. And salt has a way of transforming the world around us in that way. Now, as I think about salt, one of my favorite ideas of salt, it comes from an Old Testament idea uh, recognizing that every sacrifice that was brought to the altar had to be salted. 
Whether it was a grain offering or a meat offering, every sacrifice had to be salted. And what happened in that salting is it changed it from being something that was out there in the world, but then as salt was added to it, it made it holy before God. Made it something that could be transformed to be made as an offering to God, that could be offered to God. And so God sends us as salt in the world so that we might be transforming agents so that we might offer our lives and our world to God as a sacrifice, that we might be those transforming agents of holiness, that God would see the world and see us as his offering, his joyful sacrifice to us. And from a, one of the crazy side scriptures that's been my favorite scripture for a while, from Mark 9, 49, says, everyone will be salted with fire meaning that there's a transformation that is intended for us, just as every sacrifice is salted with salt, that everyone is expected there will be some transformation in our lives as we are called to this agency that is described as salt. And he says salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. That idea of salt losing its saltiness, you know, in our uh, modern understanding of salt, we think we have very uh, clean salt. Salt that once it is dissolved, there's nothing left. But the truth is, in the ancient world, salt was often uh, just one part of what was offered as salt. There was often grime and, and some dirt that was mixed in with the salt because they couldn't purify it to the same level that we have it today. And so salt could lose its saltiness. At the end of it, they were just pouring out sand on their food <laughs> instead of having salt. And it was possible to lose the saltiness of that flavor, of whatever that salt was. And once something has been used, how does it become salty again? Truth is, it's good for nothing. It's just to be thrown out. That salt requires for us that we have something in us, something that continuously cleanses us so that as we go into the world, we ourselves become that transforming agent in the world, that we ourselves have to be transformed. A friend of mine was telling me this story that uh, they were out on a trip, he and his wife, and uh, they went to the airport and they were waiting in line at the airport and all the lights went dark at the airport. And uh, sure enough, the ticker taker uh, said that all the flights were canceled because of the power outage. They couldn't get, you know, the flight control and everything was shut down and they couldn't go anywhere. And so they were frantically trying to find a hotel nearby and they found a hotel. And when we got to the hotel, there were no lights because the power for the entire city had gone out. And so they were, when they checked in, it was by uh, just pencil and paper and they signed in uh, for a check-in at the hotel and they got, were given a candle to go find their room. <laughs> so they, they go up the stairs with the candle and they find their room and they uh, decide they're going to open the window because the air conditioning was out. So they try to open the window and when they pulled back the curtain, there was a Marriott hotel next door with lights gleaming. <laughs> <laughs> and so the husband and wife look at each other and go, what are in the world is going on with that hotel? And so they decide to make their way down the stairs again with that candle and, and they get to the lobby and they get across the street to the Marriott hotel and sure enough they walk in and, and the hotel is lit up. There's televisions describing the blackout that's happening in the city all around them. And uh, the guy is just wondering what in the world, how is this hotel has light when everything else is dark around it? And so he found when the assistant managers or somebody with a placard on says, how is this hotel have light on when nothing else has light around it? He says, well, when we built this hotel, we made sure that we have a generator that's based off gas so that we are not related to anything else around us, but we have something in ourselves that the rest of the world doesn't have. We have something here that can generate our electricity, our power, our light, even while everything else goes dark. I love that story. <laughs> because what's interesting is sometimes when we think about who we are as a church and what we're called to do and be, and we recognize that we live in a world that is different, we wonder how are we going to find any light? How are we going to be transforming agents in the world that seems dark around us? But Jesus says, have salt in yourselves and be a light to the world. That is only possible because of what God calls us to, that is a relationship with God that begins here and now within our own hearts that isn't contingent on the world around us, even though the world might go dark. God calls us to experience something deep in us that allows for us to be different, 
allows for us to experience the love and grace and power and peace of God that the world cannot understand, but that we have direct access through the Holy Spirit. We have direct access to that connection with God, even though everything else around us seems to be speaking against the the calling of God and His work in our lives. We have that calling because of the relationship that we're called to in Jesus Christ. And so we think about light. And that that light, I was describing that hotel, and that, that light that God calls us to, and that light calls us to be purposeful. He says, that city on the hill cannot be hidden. That town on the hill cannot be hidden. And I think, too, a couple of things. One is to recognize that we are not called just to be lone rangers. He describes that city on the hill. And yes, we have that generated within us, but as a community of faith, how bright is that light? That we help to hold each other accountable, that we help to to walk together into God's purpose, purpose that he calls us to be. He calls us as his community of faith, and we support each other in that journey of faith together. So he says that you are God's people. You are a city, a gathering of people who live in a way that provides insight into God's presence for the world and for ourselves. How is it that we are called to be that light? Now, what's interesting, uh, in our small groups, we've been watching the second part of uh, Alpha. I call it Nikki Gumbel's second part, which is going through the Beatitudes. And right at the end of the Beatitudes is where we find this scripture about being salt and light. And the way Nikki describes it, he says that this is the way that God has decided to change the world. And I thought about that for a minute because we thought about all the different ways that we keep trying to change the world around us. Well, with enough money, we can change the world. Or if we had the right politicians, we could change the world. Or somehow, if we just had enough time, space, energy, or whatever else, we could change the world around us. I I had a young friend who... uh, decided that he wanted to be a part of changing the world, and so he went into being a teacher. And he realized that he was dealing with students, that they had all sorts of family issues, and so he decided to go into social work. And then socially, going into social work for a while, he realized that the real problem had to do with the legal code and the law that was around him. So he, he started to pursue another degree in law, and it just seemed like a continued spiraling to figure out what was going on. And I had other friends who had, had been in politics for a while and said, you know, we can't seem to make a difference in people's lives. I want to go back into psychology to become a counselor. All of the different ways we try to change the world, but Jesus points to these simple factors in the Beatitudes that it is the poor, the humble, the meek, to seek after mercy, to seek after peace, to seek after love, as the means that God is using to transform the world around us? It seems ridiculous in so many different ways. But it really is the only thing that really can transform the world when we recognize God's agenda for ourselves, God's agenda for the world, and we recognize who we are called to be as God's people, that we become the light bearers for the world. That when the world around us seems to be following other pieces, when we recognize that the, the situation which we, we are in sometimes feels like it's falling off the edge of the cliff. We think about the statistics of depression and addiction and, and mental health issues around us, and we wonder, how dark is the world around us? But God calls us to experience the light that can only ex- be experienced through this deep relationship of renewing of God's love for us. That can only be experienced as we embrace God's embrace of his forgiveness for us. And as we extend that forgiveness to others, it changes, it breaks the chain of the powers that continue to oppress. And we get to be called into that method of following God together. And so it's purposeful as a community of light bearers. We begin to act differently, to live differently than the world around us. And that way we penetrate the darkness It is changing the world in a way that the world doesn't even understand. In the same way that when Jesus came, he was a light to the world and the darkness could not overcome it. Jesus sends us as his people, his church, into the world. And although the world doesn't seem to understand the way in which we live, we recognize it is the only thing that has ever changed the world. That is a simple method of love and embrace and forgiveness that happens on an interpersonal basis, that happens on a one-to-one, and happens in the small community of people who are willing to act differently than the world. Again, not with violence, not with political movements, not with some sort of grandiose schemes, but with the simple acting purposefully, bearing the light of Christ into the world 
day by day. And it begins to expose the darkness. When we recognize that we are going to act and live differently than the world would expect, it exposes the darkness and the behaviors and the hearts of others. And then the opportunity is to respond, to say how it is that we're going to live in a new way for God. Not only does it, is it purposeful, not only does it penetrate, but it is perpetual. One of the great things about light is that light does not stay still. Light cannot stay still. Light is continuously moving. It is a photon in action. And we have the visible light of that activity, of that photon in movement. That is what we are called as the church. We are the photons of God sent into the world. We can't simply sit in one place and consider it good. God calls us out from the doors of the church into the world to bear his presence, to be the very peacemakers and love makers of Jesus that the world would see and know and experience, not because we declare it within the church that we are a sanctified group together, but that somehow we are expressing that light to all. That church cannot just sit still. Once it was described to me, and I think it's an interesting description, that Christians are kind of like manure. We are great when we're spread out into the field, causing growth and vitality all around us. But what happens when you throw it all together in the barn? It kind of (laughs) stinks. As a church, we are like the light being pushed out the doors into the world that the world would understand and see something of the love of God that is what we are called to be. And so as we're talking about this practice, Jesus understood himself as one who was sent. He understood the disciples as those who were being sent. And we as the church cannot sit still. But we are called to be sent into the world that we are continuously in motion, in mission with God. And therefore, Jesus says, let your good deeds be seen before all men, all people, so that they will give glory to God because they have seen that light. Now let's reflect on that for a minute. If we know that we are called, and we know that that's who we are as the church, we know that that hasn't changed in the last 2,000 years of the church, why is it? Why is it that we are not willing to do that? Why is it that the church so often struggles to share the good news, to be the presence and the witness of Christ in our world around us? And we recognize that there, God has this really weird problem with the way that he has chosen to change the world. Us. (laughs) We are fallible people. We are broken individuals. But God knows that. And God knew that initially when God designed us to be a part of his work and his world uh, plan. He chose us, knowing of our weakness, knowing of our brokenness. And I think about all the different reasons why we don't And I recognize that the biggest piece is, well, I don't want to stick out. I don't want to be seen. I don't want anyone to know what's going on in me. And so as I I hide my light, Jesus says, you don't put a a flashlight under a bed. (laughs) You put it on the light stand, right? The same way we like to hide, hide those gifts and talents. Well, I don't want to tell anybody. I don't want to stick out. But when we recognize who we are called to be and we realize what we've been called to be about, We recognize that that light is not just for ourselves, but we are called to reflect that light to the world. And if we are not doing that, we're doing exactly the opposite of what the intention is for us as God's people. We also recognize that we don't often think that we're good enough. I think often when I consider mission and the work of the church, I often hear people saying, well, I don't know enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not qualified to do the work of God. Well, here's the cool thing. If you were to open your Bible and start to read through some of the characters of the Bible, you will never find anyone who's been qualified. (laughs) Every one of them was a failure in some way and another. One of the biggest persons in the Old Testament, Moses, well, he was a murderer, a stammerer, somebody who resisted God's will, somebody who ran away from his family and his fortune in order to pursue being a sheep herder in the desert. And God called him to be one of the greatest characters of the Old Testament, to free his people from bondage. God is not looking for people who've got it all together. God's just looking for people who are saying, I'm faithful. One of the definitions of the Beatitudes of to be meek is to be yielded, to be yielded to God's ways. 
God is not looking for people who are bolstering themselves, the opposite of being meek, the arrogant. God is looking for people to say, I know that I don't got it together. As we were saying a couple weeks ago, it's okay not to be okay. Because when we know we're not okay, we are more able to recognize what God is able to do around us, in and through us, not because of us, but because of God. They will see your good deeds and give glory to God because they know what a mess you are. Might be one of the taglines we could put in there. Now we also hear sometimes, well, we don't think that, uh, you know, I, I, I'm good enough. I don't think my heart is right. Maybe I, I've got some miserable places in my heart that I'm, I'm hiding. And we're aware of our faults and our sins more than, than anyone else. And we pretend that we want to hide those. But here's this funny, funny little thing that happens. We're aware of our faults. And because we try to hide them, we stay in the darkness. We are aware of our faults and our sins. And the more we try to hide them, the more we fit and stay in the darkness. But when we're aware of our faults and we expose them to the light and recognize, Lord, I am a mess and you know that I'm a mess and I'm going to share the way that God is transforming my life before others, we let the light of God into our hearts and into our lives. And in that way, we are transformed. And instead of staying in the darkness, we suddenly start moving to the light. And suddenly we recognize that it isn't our, our part of being transformed, but God transforming through us that the world sees. And they give glory to God because they can see the goodness of God through them. In the Old Testament, it talks about how God was able to use a donkey to speak his good news. If God can use an ass, he can use us. The truth is, none of us have it together, but God is able to use us as salt and light, not because we are worthy, not because we are good, but because of who God is. And who is it that Jesus says is blessed? Is it the rich? Isn't the proud? Isn't the boastful? Isn't the people who have things together? But the Beatitudes, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers, the merciful, for they will be called the children of God. And it is them, it is exactly that people, those people who are recognizing our low position, our humble estate, our own depravity and our need of God, that God says, yes, you are the salt of the world. You are the light to the nations. Go. And be the bearers of light that all the world would be changed. My hope as you hear these words, that there's some encouragement that you get from God. That God knows you. God knows where you're at. God loves you. But our God calls us to yield our lives to him. That the world has not yet seen one who is fully devoted to God. What might God do with even the little bit that we would be willing to yield into his hands. Let us yield our hearts together in prayer. Lord God, we thank you that you are one who is sending and who has sent. We recognize as we hear those words, we often think that they belong to somebody else or someone who's better off in some other way or knows more. But you call us. And we recognize that we are not worthy. But God, we ask that you would speak to our hearts, that you would allow for us to just put our faith in your hands and say, Lord, of what I have, of the time I have left here, of the gifts that I have that I may or may not have been used wisely, help me to be your instrument of light and peace in this world. Use me today. And this we would pray in Jesus' name. Amen. He invites us to stand as we sing the song together, The Summons. It's from a Faith We Sing book, uh, but the words are going to be on the screen for us.
invite you to be seated. So as we continue in our time of worship, we have an opportunity to respond to God with our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. Uh, during the time of pandemic, and has become now our new tradition, uh, the offering plates are there in the back, and so we invite you to make use of those as you would feel led. And for those of you who are watching online, to note you might uh, use the website that is listed there, or mail in the offerings to the addresses that are provided. And as we recognize the many ways that God continues to care for us, let us respond with a prayer of thanksgiving. God, we recognize that from our first breath, you have continued to pour into our life all that is needed. And even beyond, you have given us gifts and abilities, not just for our own benefit that we might share with the world, that your work would be done in and through us. And so, Lord, today as we provide these offerings, we recognize that they are a portion of all that we have and all that we are, and ask, Lord, that you would receive them as that offering that is offered before you as a sign of thanksgiving for what you have given to us, that you might use them for the building of your kingdom. And this we would pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand to the doxology together. As we continue in our time of worship, we have an opportunity to share our joys and concerns together. Uh, as we gather, what is on your heart that you would want us to lift up together in prayer today? I know that uh, for me it's a joy to see all of you here. I know that uh, many people from our congregation and our community have come through COVID and others continue to wrestle with that. But we thank God for his healing hand and for those who are in recovery, we offer prayer. So Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Other joys and concerns we want to lift up together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, prayers for Jim Batts uh, for his healing and for the diagnostic that's happening this week. Lord, in your min uh, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Other joys and concerns. Ruthie. We lift up Janice Bigelow together in prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Yes, Dave. A revival has broken out at Asbury um, University. Uh, started last Wednesday, and it's spreading primarily between students in different universities, Cedarville, uh, Lee University, about 22. People are coming from all over the world to experience the presence of God in that place. Mm -hmm. uh, two of my grandchildren who live in, in Wilmore have already been up there and got the blessing. So mm -hmm. I think we should pray that this revival spreads throughout the world. Amen. Yeah. David's lifting up the revival that's happening in Asbury University, and uh, we continue to pray for God's blessing in and through uh, that seminary and the, the university, as well as for the world. Uh, Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah, our yeah. prayers. Others, uh, Ruthie, again. Our daughter Jennifer called us this morning, and um, her headaches are fine. They are gone. She is doing okay. And um, but she is calling for the Okay. So she is one thing after Indeed. Well, prayers, uh, joy that uh, she has experienced some healing, but continued prayers for her healing as she faces these uh, kidney stones. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayers. Yes. I want to pray for Diane. We're going to have an open heart surgery next month. Okay. Very good. So prayers for Diane as she faces uh, surgery next month. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayers. Others would not share you. Yeah. 
Okay. Prayers for Joe, for his hands. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Yeah, Donna. Okay. Okay. So prayers for Alex and for Courtney for healing. Uh, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. I invite us to join our hearts together in prayer as we look to the Lord together. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks that you are the Lord of all life. We are not alone in our journey and our struggles, but that you walk with us each and every step of the way. And God, as we lift up together the names of those who are needing your hand of healing, we seek you out, God, because we know in our own strengths we are in need. We are not able to overcome those various challenges that are in front of us. But we recognize how great your hand of healing is, how great your love is to us, that it abounds and seeks beyond even when we have sought you out. But Lord, that you have sought us out first and foremost. And so it gives us trust and hope in our hearts that we might come before you with all that we have. That you know us each by name. That we are never lost from you. We recognize our community that continues to struggle in many different ways. And our hearts are broken by the brokenness in the families, the brokenness in people's lives, the struggles that people have with their finances and their mental health and the variety of ways that we see the struggle around us. But God, we know that you are more than capable of meeting each and every need. That even as we see the darkness around us, you call us to be your instruments of light and transformation. So we recognize that you call us to be a people who are sent. Sent in ministry of love and compassion and care and justice. So that all might know of your love. And all this through Jesus Christ who teaches us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. They will be done on earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Final song together, Here I Am, Lord. It's hymn number 593. Invite us to stand as we sing the song together.
close our service together. I believe there is refreshments downstairs. So one of the benefits of being here in person is enjoying those. And so I invite you to go downstairs after we close our service together. And as we do close the service, I invite you to turn your hearts and hands to God in whatever way is comfortable for you as you receive the blessing of God. And Lord, that you would pour out your spirit on all who are gathered here, that we would sense and know of your sending, that we might see your hand at work in and through our lives, that all might know of your love. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace.